You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Mum kicked me out when I was 11. That's when she first kicked me out. We went to social services, went to the actual building, social services. And my mum sat me down. Um, we sat down in front of this woman on a desk and she looked at my mum. And my mum looked at her and went, you need to take my son. And the woman was like, we're not going to take your son. Like, you're his mum, we can't do that. And she was like, well, you either take my son now or I'm just going to leave him here. So the woman looked at my mum again and she went, well, you can't do that. You get me like, that's your son. So my mum just got up and walked out and left me there. During that robbery, I punched, I punched a guy. And when I punched him, I hit him so hard, I broke his cheekbone and his eye socket. I said, you know, why are we doing this? And he said, we're repping the ends, Hez. Repping the ends, bro. Repping the postcode, fam. We have to, bro. We have to. You get me? And I looked at him and I said, you're telling me we do, we've done all of this over a postcode, blood? Even though I knew it was over a postcode anyway. But I said to him and it just hit me and I was like, man have died over this, bruv. Like, man have lost man's life for a letter and a few numbers, fam. And we both looked at each other and he looked at me and he said, Rahez, I've never really thought about you like that, you know. And I said, fam, man are losing man's life over a letter and a few numbers, blood. I said, you want to know what's even more deep? My mum don't even own a house in the ends, fam. So technically, I'm fighting for the council. Put his hand on me and he said, I just want to say I'm proud of you. From the man that you was to the man that you are now. He said, I'm proud of you. Bro, different kind of thing, fam. <sighs> different, I can't, even, I can't even talk about it, blood. It just wows me up, blood. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Hez Ron Brown. How are you, brother? Good, man. I'm good. How are you? Phenomenal, mate. Feeling good? That's good. That's good. That's good. Thank you for getting me down here, man. It's been a, oh, it's a it's pleasure, nice pleasure, mate. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Pleasure Phenomenal well. story, brother. Thank you. Thank you. From street gangs mm -hmm. to then winning the Pride of Britain, which is a yeah, phenomenal man. achievement mm. from your life. I watched your story on um, Lad Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Millions of views and very rightly so. It's um, powerful stuff. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, Talk about some of that stuff today as yeah, well. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the trauma for the past to then changing your life and that's what we're all about, man, is finding motivation. No matter how fucked up your life is, mm -hmm. you're living proof that people can change. Thank you, man, I appreciate yeah. that, trust me. I appreciate that a lot, trust me. How's life been? Life has been good, you know, life's been good. Obviously, I've got my own company, More Talk, More Action. So we, we deliver mentoring and lived experience training across the country, doing like skill-based activities for young people as well. So things have been going good since winning, since winning the Pride of Britain. Just had a bit more um, contacts come through and people wanting to, you know, do things for the company, get involved with the company. So we've been able to impact a lot more young people's lives. So yeah, no, it's been really good. Been that's really what good. it's all about. We'll plug that straight away. Where can people find us, company? Um, so... On Instagram, you can type it in on Instagram, more talk, more action. Um, again, people can just message me directly on Instagram as well, Hezron Brown. We've also got a Facebook account, more talk, more action again as well. We've also got a website, www.moretalkmoreaction.org.uk. Perfect. We'll leave all that stuff in the description as well. Thank you. Always go back to the start with my guest, brother. Mm. Where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, man. So basically, let me kind of... I need to shorten my story down because my story's <laughs> long, you know. The story's long. Um, so when I was like five years old, I fell in a bath of boiling hot water. I burnt the whole upper right-hand side of my body. Um, a lot of people go, nah, man, that's like, that's crazy. You burned off, like, how did that happen? So back in the day in our house, um, we never like had central heating. Like you had to turn on like a switch and then that switch heated up the water over time, yeah? One night we got in and my mum was like, my mum said to my sister, ah, oh, it's too late to kind of, you know, boil the water. So just boil some water in a kettle or, and, and, in, and in the pot on the stove and just fill up the baby basin. It was a baby basin. Yes, yeah, so not like an actual full-on bath that I found. It was a baby basin. So my sister's filling up the baby basin. I went upstairs. I was being fast. I was around like five years old at this point. I was being fast. I, start, I climbed up onto the side of the bath, balancing on the side of the bath and I slipped and I fell in. But I had a jumper on at the time and it had little holes in it. And when I fell into the water, my skin melted through the holes in my jumper. So my jumper was on the inside of my body. So my mum come upstairs out of panic. She ripped my jumper off. Obviously, it's a panicking moment. I'm screaming. My sister's screaming. So my mum's just come up and like ripped my jumper off out of panic. 
I mean, she ripped it off, she ripped all my skin off at the same time. So, I don't know if you, uh, there. So, if you can see around there, that's where it starts. That's where the jumper run, that's where the jumper was. So, obviously, all that skin there, it goes all across my chest, down my stomach, around on my side. So, all that skin's actually from my legs. It's from my, it's from my thighs. I was, in, I was in hospital for a, for a considerable amount of time. And then I was having skin grafts, so the skin from my legs being put onto my right-hand side of my body. And then when I, came out, when I came out of hospital, as you can imagine, primary school, people starting to bully me, call me names. And that's when things really started to change for me, you know? Um, developed a really bad anger problem, and it was uncontrollable. I would black out, couldn't control myself. I didn't, I didn't know how to control myself as well, you know what I mean? Because again, as you can imagine, at that young age, I'm just like, the, the emotions are just taking me over, you know what I'm saying? So at this point, um, I'm growing up, I'm getting kicked out of primary school, I'm getting kicked out of secondary school again for fighting. I'm fighting everybody. If you was a guy, I was fighting you. That was just it, because that was what it was like in my head. Because I got it into my head as like, I wanted to become this big bad guy. But I knew the only way to become this big bad guy is if I had fights with, with, with the guys in it. So that's all I wanted to do. So every day I was fighting to school, in school, from school. Then it spilled out into my home life. I'm fighting my mom. I'm fighting my, my brothers. I'm fighting my sisters, my cousins, anyone that kind of came into my facility. You know what I mean? Because again, I wanted to build this name for myself. And, but that again was destroying my relationship at home with my mom. So my mom um, couldn't handle me. She couldn't handle me as a young person. I was punching holes through the doors. I took out half of my wall. I picked my wardrobe up and threw my wardrobe down the stairs at my mum. It took out half of my wall and my mum jumped out the way. I've had fights with the police in my house, all sorts, because my mum couldn't handle me. So she would call the police, thinking that the police were gonna do something with me. But actually the police were then making it worse because now I'm having fights with the police in my house. The police are trying to break my hands in the car when they handcuffed me in the car. Never put the seatbelt on me. I'm in the back seat, handcuffed me at the, behind my back. And the, the policeman, he was driving the car. And as he, as he was driving fast, he slammed on the brakes. So now I was headbutting the front of the seat. And every time I was headbutting the front of the seat, he's like, have I hurt you yet? And I was like, nah, you ain't hurt me. Carried on again, drove fast again, slammed on the brakes. Boom, have I hurt you yet? Nah, you're not, you haven't hurt me. So again, like, these were the kind of things that I was experiencing when I was growing up, which was then again, fueling my anger, making me worse. How old were you then? Then points there, I was like 11. 11, 12, um, mum kicked me out when I was 11. That's when she first kicked me out. We went to social services, went to the actual building, social services, and my mum sat me down. Um, we sat down in front of this woman on a desk and she looked at my mum and my mum looked at her and went, you need to take my son. And the woman was like, we're not gonna take your son. Like, you're his mum, we can't do that. And she was like, well, you either take my son now or I'm just gonna leave him here. So the woman looked at my mum again and she went, well, you can't do that. You get me like, that's your son. So my mum just got up and walked out, left me there. I went and moved in with my eldest sister, lived with her for a year. Um, and then I moved back in with my mum. Now the relationship that me and my mum had was that she would kick me out and I'll go back home. She would kick me out and I'll go back home. That was our relationship. And even though I knew she was gonna kick me out, I always went back home because that's my home, right? That's where I grew up, you know what I mean? Um, and then from there, it still continued to happen. She was kicking me out. I'm sleeping rough on the street. I'm going to school, knowing the night before I was sleeping on the canal. Well, for weeks I was sleeping on the canal, literally sleeping in, sleeping in the bush. The main meals I used to have for the day were the meals that I was having at school, but no one knew. I'm acting like everything's normal. I'm walking the roads like everything's normal. I'm chilling with my friends, acting like everything's normal. And what I used to do with them, I used to chill with them until it got dark. And then when it got dark and everyone was like, yeah, I'm gonna go home now, I just used to go to the canal. Did you never say to anyone? Did hmm? you never say to anyone? There was a few times, like I, I sofa surfed at people's houses, there was a couple of times. Um, but again, it was that embarrassment in it. Like, I don't wanna go and tell people that I'm homeless. You know what I mean? Don't wanna tell people that I'm on the street. Don't wanna tell people that I'm living that way. And again, it was like an ego thing, cause I'm meant to be this, this hard guy in it. I'm meant to be this guy that's, that's trying to build his reputation. So how am I meant to be that guy building that reputation and I'm going to man saying to man, I'm homeless? I don't mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was like an ego thing for me. So I moved back in with my mom. And then when I was 13, me and my mom had a massive argument and she ended up kicking me out again. So now I'm back on the street again. 
and I ended up moving in with, he weren't even, a, he was a guy that went to my school. And one day I went to his house, just knocked on his door. The only reason why I knew where he lived was because I watched him go to his house one day. And I knocked on his door and his mum answered. Never met his mum before, ever. And she looked at me and I said, oh, is, is so-and-so there? She said, no, nah, he's, not, he's not here. And I said, oh, okay. And I started to walk away. And as I went to walk away, she stopped me. And she said, young man, come back, come back. So I went back. And she said, I can sense there's something wrong with you. I can sense there's something happening in your life. What's going on? Feel your energy. She could feel the energy. And I was like, nothing. Bearing in mind, I had just woke up from sleeping on the street and went to her yard. And she went, now nah, I can sense there's something going on. She went, come, in, come, come inside, have a hot drink. So I went inside, had a hot drink. And she sat me down again and she said, tell me what's going on. She said, just tell me the truth. I can see in your face. And I sat there and I told her, told her that I was living on the street, had a bad relationship with my mum. And she looked at me and she said, nah, man, your mum don't want to look after you. I said, nah. She said, it's all right, you can live here. Like that. Took me into her house. Took me into her house. Um, lived with her for two years. A random woman I've never met before in my whole entire life. Ended up living with her for two years. That woman is the most important woman in my life. Like, if I ever told you the, the, how highly I I regard her. I call her mum, my kids call her nan. I visit her daily. Like, she messages me weekly. Hezron, are you okay? Son, are you okay? And it's just like, this woman isn't even my mum. But I lived with her for two years, from when I was 13 to 15. Now, I left school when I was 15 because I was the youngest in my year. Birthday's in August. So when I was transitioning from school to college, I was still like 15. And my mum found out where I was. Bearing in mind, my mum lives around the corner from this woman. My mum found out where I was two years later. Took my, mom, took my mom two years, yeah? She found out where I was. She came. She physically kicked the door off its hinges. Came into the house with, with one of my sisters. And she demanded that I come back home. Now, this woman looked at me and she said, Hezron, no, you can either continue to live here or you can go back home and live with your mum. It's completely up to you. But I made that choice to go back home and move in with my mum. People always say, Hezron, why did you do that? And I say to them, I did it because for the whole two years that I was living with this woman, even though she was very important to me and she was, a, she was stepping in as that mother figure for me, the only real person that I actually wanted was my mum in it. My real mum. The only place that I really wanted to be was at home, in my own bed, in my own room, you know? So now that my mom's here asking me to go home, I'm going home in it. That's that's I'm doing that. So I went home. A week later, my mom came back out again. <laughs> so you were always chasing your mom's affection. Always chasing. How it, mate. was that to be in a volatile relationship with getting through all the time to being homeless, nobody caring basically mm. to then be in a loving home? Did you accept that straight away? Or did it take time? I accepted it straight away, and actually, funnily enough, my attitude changed. When I moved in with this woman, I didn't disrespect her once. I didn't speak to her disrespectfully. I never acted disrespectfully. If she told me to wash up, I washed up them plates. Yeah, I didn't try and back chat. Um, because again, I saw it as you have come, stepped out of your way to help me. And for me to come into your house and disrespect you in your house, nah. But then when I would go home, I would disrespect my mom. I had a walked, it's like, how can I explain it? Like, people will do things in their own house, but they won't do it out in, at other people's house. Especially as black people. You go to a next man's yard, out of respect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your mom, if, if his mum says to you, yo, can you just wash up them two dishes? I'm washing up the dishes, man. Yo, your mum your mom asked me to wash up the dishes, so I'm washing up the dishes. But I wouldn't wash up the dishes in my own house, though. My, me and my mum's fighting before I'm doing that. You get what I mean? So, again, I've done it out of mutual respect. Because her son was also in my year at school. Yeah. So again, it was out of respect. I didn't want to disrespect him and his mum. I, I thought that was unacceptable. So I, I, done I done everything that she said. I never disrespected her. So I accepted that love that she was giving to me off the bat straight away. And, and I didn't want to ruin that by disrespecting me because I knew if I ruin that relationship there, where else am I going? I got nowhere else to go. So I'm going to end up back on the street. Yeah. So really, I had, to, I had to be respectful. What was your mum's relationship not bringing like with her family? My mum's upbringing. Yeah. My mum's, well, I've never actually spoken to my mum about her upbringing. It was only 
quite recently, actually, that I just mentioned it. And I said, mum, you know, because me, me and my real mum, I actually live with my real mum now. Me and my mum, we, 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 we're closer than close now. But again, that's because of age and I've grown up matured and I'm, I've matured, you know what I mean? I'm not that person that I was when I was 13 years old. Um, so I said to mum the other day and I said, looked at her and I said, mum, like, what have you been through in your life? And she looked at me, she said, Hezron, that's something that I don't even want to talk to you about. And I said, why? And she said, because it's too horrific. And I was like, hmm. So when she said that to me, it kind of made me think, no wonder why we've been, why we've brought up the way we've brought up. You know what I mean? Because she's faced tragedy in her own life. She's traced, she's faced trauma in her own life. So that's mirrored onto us. All of my brothers and sisters, well, all of my sisters and me have been kicked out of the house. None of us have left willingly. Mm -hmm. So my three sisters and me have all been kicked out of the house. Yeah, but that tells you that your mum's clearly battling with something. Maybe she's got oh. abandonment issues. And like you said, it's 100%. mirror image. And it's to break that connection that you would have done. You clearly still would do anything for your mum. Oh, 100%. How does she feel that everything you're doing now, does she accept that? Does she give you love? And Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like my mum knows, mm -hmm. like um, I was on a Zoom call actually the other day, um, giving a talk to some young people and everyone was asking about my mum, like, you know, where's your mum now? And what does, and you know, like how, what's your relationship like? And I went, just, just one second, guys. Hold on. And I went, Mom! Mom! She was like, what? I said, just one second. I went downstairs. I put the camera in her face. She was like, oh my gosh, here's one. And everyone was like, oh, is that your mom? And I was like, yeah, man, that's my mom. You know. I'm How does she feel now. about that? You were saying that when she used to kick you out. Is she, is she okay with that as well? Yeah, like, again, we've had to have our uh, conversation. We had to, like, when I, when I went back to my mom, we had to sit down and actually have a heart-to-heart -heart talk to talk to each other. Because one thing that me and my mum did was we shouted at each other. I'm quite a loud speaking person, naturally. My mum's the same. So when me and my mum are talking to each other, it actually sounds like we're arguing, but we're not. We're just having a normal conversation. But sometimes, because I'm quite quick-tempered and she's quick-tempered, whenever some, all it takes is one little spark and we're both up in raw trying to fight each other. But again, through age and maturity, I realise that I don't need to be doing that with my mum. Because at the end of the day, she's my mum. You only get one mum. And I'm not that person anymore, so I don't want to be like that. But um, we had to sit down and have the heart to heart and speak together and, and just kind of like iron out all of those kinks. You know, we had to, I had to tell her, because my mum doesn't even know half of the things that I've done in my life. From the age of, from when she, she, from when she last kicked me out from when I was 15, she doesn't know anything that's happened to me since I was 15 up until now. That Has she ever like asked that. or she just tried to block it out? She's, she's never asked. Do you see a lot of your, your traits in your mum? I would say, yeah. Yeah. I would say there are certain traits of me that I do get from my mum. There are certain traits that I get from my dad. Um, but a lot of it more is probably from my mum. You know, my mum's quite a... My mum's quite a hard woman, you know what I mean? She's quite hard and stern. She's a typical Jamaican woman, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just like ready for war every two <laughs> seconds, like ready to have a fight every five minutes. And it's like, I, I, I'm in that same, I've got that same mentality that my mum does, you know what I mean? Um, but but she, my, mom, my, mom's, my mom's a good woman. And what people need to understand is that it wasn't my mum's fault when I was younger. Because even again, from the comments that I've been seeing on like the Lad Bible um, video and stuff like that, everyone's like, yo, his mum's bad. How can his mum kick him out and all this kind of stuff? And what I have to say is, you don't know what I was like when I was younger. You wasn't physically there when like me and my mum's, uh, it's nothing that I'm proud of. Me and my mum's had physical fights. Like I throw my mum through doors. I threw my mum through it. We had a marble table in our living room. I threw my mum through the table. Like I've took out knives to my mum. All sorts. So when people are saying, oh, your mum your mom shouldn't have kicked you out. How can your mum kick out you when, 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 you was, when you was 11 or them kind of thing? Because those are the things that I was doing. She, she didn't know she what couldn't. to do with you. And she didn't know what to do with me. She didn't know how to handle that. She didn't know how to manage that. And for me and my temper, and I had strength when I was young, man. Like, I, had, I was quite strong when I was younger. And my mum couldn't physically fight me. I was too strong for her. That's why, again, she was always calling the police because she didn't know what else to do. She didn't know how else to manage it. Mm -hmm. She probably feels for her own life at some points. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. We even had the conversation about it the other day and, and, 
at times, she even said to my face, she said, Hezron, I was scared of you when you was younger. Yeah. My own mum was saying, Hezron, I was scared of you when I was like 12. So when did you start getting into the gang life? So that started happening more towards when, so when I got um, kicked out, I was taken in by, um, well, I went to an emergency accommodation. And when I was at the emergency accommodation, I was put into that through the council. And I was staying there. And then they put me into a temporary accommodation, which was a two bedroom, uh, fully furnished flat. No, a one bedroom, fully furnished flat, sorry. Um, had that when I just turned 16. Trying to find college. And then I eventually found a college, but no college wanted to take me in because I never had no grades, but one college did. And they told me that I had to um, do two years of further education to make up the grades. So I said, okay, cool, I'm gonna do that. Now, when I was at college, that's when I started to hang around with people that I wasn't normally hanging around with before. People that weren't even from my area, you know, and I started to hang around with them because of the college that I went to. It was quite central in, um, in, in Birmingham. So a lot of people from different areas would go into that college and stuff like that. So I started to mix with people from there. Again, not even realizing it's really a gang thing. It was just more like, you know, it's just certain man that man's are rolling with, man's are just chilling with. I ended up getting kicked out of college, um, got kicked out of college in my first year, and then started wandering the streets. Now I'm in town every day. That's all I can do. I'm just in town, walking around, chilling. And then because I'm central, because I'm so central again, there's so much people from different areas now that I'm mixing with. And because I'm not going to college, now I start mixing with those guys even more and we jamming and we, we chilling and we walking around. And then eventually, man start going to parties. Then you go into this place and you go into that place and then you're getting brought on this ride out. You go in on that ride out and then slowly... You find out that actually, yo, raw, man's, man's repping now. <laughs> like I'm repping now, like work one. Like I got ballys hanging out my pocket. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like I got ballys hanging out my pocket and that I'm throwing up signs and I'm just like, I don't even know how that even, how that even happened. But it just happened because there was nothing else to do. You know, um, from when I was living in my temporary accommodation, the council then put me into my permanent accommodation, which was a two bedroom unfurnished flat. So I had a two bedroom unfurnished flat when I was 16. I'm on job seekers allowance. I'm literally getting, I was getting what, like, <coughs> I was getting like 60 pounds, 60, 80 pounds every two weeks from the job center. Bearing in mind, I don't know, really know how to spend this money. I've never really gone shopping before. I've never really bought clothes before. I remember the first time I went to, um, I went shopping and I had my money. I didn't, even know, I didn't even know what to buy because I didn't know how to cook. What am I buying from the shop? You get me? I'm buying packs of biscuits and Doritos <laughs> for my dinner because that's the only thing that yeah. I know. I'm buying sweets and crisps. You get me? I didn't know how to make a meal. Um, I never even had a cooker to even make a meal in. I never had a fridge, I never had nothing. So I spent most of my days out on the road. But then as I'm out on the road, the guys that I'm hanging around with, they're showing me love in it. They're showing me love that I wasn't getting from anywhere else. And now, and this is what I try and make people understand. To me, it wasn't a gang. Family. It's a family thing. It's a brotherhood. We're brothers. It's not a gang. Accepted. Like, we're, we're brothers. Like, like, a lot of the mandem as well was in similar situations that I was in. Broken homes. Broken homes. Dad weren't around. Or mum weren't around. Um, bad relationships with their parents. Again, bad anger problems. Again, now, man's, man's not saying that those things are, are um, you know acceptable and like you know just because we had those things we we had to enter a gang i'm not saying that but because of that brotherhood that, that we had it just we just fitted in we just fitted in we just fitted in that's that, that, that's all that you can say you fitted in but then it gets to that point now whereas because i didn't care about anybody else and because i because i was on that certain path anyway i just decided to spiral down it even more. Why I might as well go further down the rabbit hole in it. I'm already in the rabbit hole, so why don't I just go further down it? Might as well. So that's what I was doing. Now I'm now we've got guns. Now I'm selling I'm selling coke. I'm selling cocaine and I'm going into big warehouses where man's are chopping down weed. Man's are chopping down plants of weed. We had bathtubs full of weed. You know what I mean? Like I remember I remember the first time I started sell, um, selling uh, cocaine. And it was funny because what happened was um, my bridging, he gave, he, he, gave, he, gave me, he gave me the cocaine, yeah, he gave me the drugs and it was all wrapped up already. It was all wrapped up, ready to sell. But, okay, now listen to how, this is how mad this is. 
some of those raps that he gave me was candle wax. Hmm? He had crushed up can candle wax and literally crushed it up and then wrapped it. But some of it, some of it was actual cocaine. You get me? So imagine now, um, I saw one of my other bridgings, because I've never sold cocaine before. I don't know what it even is. You get me? And um, I said to my bridge, I said, oh, I've got this thing off one of my boys. And he was like, do you even know if it's real? I said, I don't even know. And we had another bridging that, that done coke. So he came and he took out one of the bags and he, he sniffed it. Like that. <laughs> and he was like, yo, that's, that's good stuff, you know, bro. That's good stuff. And I was like, is it? See? I didn't even know what, if, if it was good or not. I didn't know anything about it. So I was like, okay, cool. And I said to my bridging, I said, bro, how do man even sell that blood? Like, <laughs> walk one. Like, man's just gave it to me. But what do I do with it, really? So then he started saying, okay, cool, well, you got, you got any contacts, you got any links? I was like, nah, bro, I don't know any bit. Think about that. He was like, all right, cool, well, just come chill with me for a bit and whatever. So then started to kind of, he then kind of sold it for me on behalf of me and then just kind of gave me a little bit of the money, you get what I'm saying? But kind of then started to learn the ropes of it and kind of like how, how you operated with, with the drugs, you know what I mean? Again, sometimes we had like, some man would lick a crop or something like that. You get what I'm saying? They'll go and go lick a, lick a big crop and man would just split the money off that. Or I was doing um, little bits of work here and there. I was doing security work, actually. I was doing like site security with like dogs and stuff. I started doing a bit of that, all cash in hand stuff. Never anything like big, nothing on the books. Just doing a lot of cash in hand work, just trying to survive. Um, and as I said, like man was doing robberies and things like that. Listen, man was doing things that man weren't proud of, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And a lot of it I was doing, again, because I was trying to survive, but also as well, just because I was trying to fit in. What kind of robberies? Just all sorts, car robberies, man was running up in people's houses, he said, just like crops. Man was going like, more going for crops, you know what I'm saying? Man was going for the big crops, trying to find, all the time he was trying to find a big crop. You're walking down the road, <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to sniff yeah. out a crop in someone's house. see all the cotton like, shot yeah, over, yeah. yeah. You see all the blacked out windows, black <laughs> curtains, and you're like, the house has weed in it. Yeah. And he's just like, no, it doesn't, bro. Nah, it's got all the signs of having weed in it, bro. Look, it's got blacked out windows and all this black curtains. The window is open. Got a little tube hanging out the window. And like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's got weed in there. And next thing you know, you find yourself later on that night trying to run up in the house. But as I said, it was, it was just mad. I remember, I remember there, was a, there was a time and um, we had a gun, yeah. We had a gun. And there was about six of us. Don't know where this gun came from. Don't know where it came from, but this geezer just came with it. And everyone was bare, bare gassed. Everyone was like, yo, bro, like, oh, let's shoot it. You get me like, let's shoot, let's shoot. And I was like, all right, cool. So everyone's just one round in it, man's just shooting the gun. It was one round, you get me? And um, one of my bridges, he takes the gun and he, and he fires it, but never realised the, the backfire and he broke his wrist as he shot the gun. <laughs> man was like, blood. Take him, take him to Dudley Road Hospital. Take him to Dudley Road Hospital, <laughs> take him Dudley Road Hospital. man <laughs> broke his wrist. Man's walking in there like, what happened to him? Oh, he fell over, you know, he fell over and fell, must have mashed up his hand and that when he fell over. You know what I mean? It's like little stupid things like that, you know what I'm saying? And again, when you're in that world, I always say to people, when you're in that world, them things are like, them things are minor. Yeah. Like. But it's scary how fast they can spiral out of control. Very, very like quickly. And again, when I speak to people, I say, you know, to get those things, as I said, is minor. One phone call, <laughs> one phone call and, and it's there. It's not a problem. I remember um, I had an incident and after the incident, I saw one of my friends and I was telling him about the incident and he said, Hezron, you know there's a shotgun around the corner with one shell in it, innit? And I said, oh, nah. And he went, but if you need it, it's round the corner. I told me where it is, round the corner in some, in some tree. He said, and you'll find it there, one shotgun with one shell. He said, but if you use it, you have, to, you, have, you have to let man know that you've used it. I was like, see? There was so much people that like, I used to hang around with that just walked with guns, like it was nothing, in their JD bag. Man had it in their JD bag back in the day, in their drawstring, J, drawstring JD bag. That was always the thing that you looked out for first. <laughs> their JD yeah. bag, if they had a JD bag. But how many of those how kids, many, how many you know of those mean? kids walk in the streets how just now? Even now? Even now, Do you know what I mean? obviously it now it's more worse. knives and yeah. man trying to get machetes out mm. and big zombie knives and all them kind of things. But it was scary to how much people were had access to them things. When did you start trying to make the transition? When did you start trying to improve your life? So that happened when, so we'd done a robbery. The robbery happened 
and I was at Crown Court, it got to Crown Court, because I had just turned 18. So because I turned 18, now it's got to Crown Court, yeah? So I'm in Crown Court, we're going through it, man's are thinking, nah, this is, this is cool, like, it's fine, like, everything's blessed. And um, I'm there pleading not guilty, I'm there like, nah, I'm not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And I had a, um, you know, you got a, your barrister. But my barrister wasn't my barrister. He was like a duty barrister. So he was someone that worked in the court. Yeah. So he wasn't someone that I had paid for. So we got this barrister. But those are the ones that you just don't want to get because they're no good. They're not really actually on your side. They're just trying to get through the cases, through mm -hmm. the court. So imagine now, it got to about the fifth day. I had done my testimony already in the dock. Yeah. I won't lie. They made me look stupid. They made me look stupid in the dock. Because I didn't, I wasn't clued up. I never knew nothing really. And um, now it's the man's them turn to go into the dock. So man goes to the dock. But bearing in mind, I seen man that day and he wasn't looking at me. He wasn't looking at me. He was with his mum. Because again, we're still young. He was only like just turned 18. And he was with his mum and he's looking down at the ground. I'm saying, yo, bro, you're cool. And he's just looking down at the ground, not saying nothing. And I was thinking, that's weird, you get me? And at the time I was with my sister. Two of my sisters came to the court. And um, I looked at my sisters and I said, nah, my man's acting, my man's acting dodgy still. Like, my sisters was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, he's acting dodgy. We got into the court, I'm sat in the dock. My man goes into the, into the stand. My man's like, yeah, my man did all that. Like, pointing at me like, yeah, that guy there, he was the one that done everything. I don't even know him. That's how he's doing in court. My man's like, I don't actually know who he is. I looked at my sisters, I remember it. <laughs> Clear as day. I looked at my sisters, my sister's looking at me, mouth open, like, I'm look, looking at him like, what's he doing? My man's in the court, I don't know who he is. Nah, my man done everything still. My man just came up and just done this and that. And, and I was sat there like, looking at him and he couldn't even look at me in my face. And I was just like, rah. That was snatch. Like, rah, that is actually mad. So then imagine, come out of the court, a um, couple of days later, it was the sentencing and I got found guilty. The other man then got found innocent, found innocent. I then had to plead guilty my, because the barrister came up to me and said, from that testimony, you have to plead guilty because if you plead not guilty, it's gonna be curtains basically. And I was like, okay. But again, I'm just listening to what the barrister's saying because I don't know, you get me, I'm not clued up. So I, I just went, okay, cool, I'll plead guilty. So then it comes to the, um, the sentencing, I was like, how do you plead? I said, oh, guilty. And then the judge looked at me and said, I'm going to make an example out of you. So what the, that's what the judge said to me. And then she was like, come back in so, so much time for your, for, for like your sentencing. So I said, okay, cool. Now, the reason why that happened was during that robbery, I punched, I punched a guy. And when I punched him, I hit him so hard, I broke his cheekbone and his eye socket. When the police arrested me, they thought I hit him with a weapon. So they were like, did you hit him with a hammer? And I said, nah, I hit him with my fist. And they were like, there's no way you hit him that hard with your fist that you caused that much damage. And I said, I hit him with my fist. And then when they found out that I'd done like martial arts and boxing, when I was in the court, the judge looked at me and told me that I was a weapon and told me that I was a danger to society because I know how to fight. And because I, what, 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 what she said was, because I constantly hit a target every day, I know how to physically cause harm to someone. So in that situation, instead of hitting him, I should have done something different. That's why she said, I'm gonna make an example out of you on your sentencing. So I've gone away. I've gone to um, my pre-sentencing report at probation. I walked in the door and there was this, this black woman standing there. And I walked in the door and she just looked at me and she just went, not another black man. That's what she did. And I went, what? She went, are you my next appointment? I said, I don't know. She went, what's your name? I said, Hezron Brown. She said, sit down in the chair, man. I said, sit down in the chair. So I'm thinking, who's this woman? You get me like, who's she talking to? So I sat down in the chair and sat there. And then she calls me into like a little, little room, little box room. So I'm sat there and she goes, tell me what happened, man. She went, lay straight. She said, tell me what happened. I said, nah, I ain't telling you what happened. I ain't telling you what happened. I ain't no snitch. I ain't telling you what happened. 
She went, snitch. She said, little man, you can't even be a snitch. She said, your friends are already snitched on you. You already got found guilty. <laughs> already got found guilty. She was like, where have you got snitch in your head? She was like, you do know you got found guilty, innit? And I was like, yeah. And she said, so what are you talking about being a snitch? Everything's already been out in the court. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, see? And she said, look, I'm going to be real with you. She said, depending on how today goes, depends on how you get sentenced. And I was like, okay. And she was like, just tell me what happened, man. But she went, tell me your involvement. She went, tell me what you did. What did you do? So I told her what I did. And then after when I told her what I did, I told her about like, my upbringing and stuff like that. Cause she asked me, she said, how have you brought, how you been brought up and whatever. And I, and I told her. And afterwards she started laughing. And she was like, <laughs> and I looked at her, I said, why are you laughing for? She went, you're not going to prison. I said, what? She went, you're not going to prison. She said, if you go to prison, you're going to end out 10 times worse than you are now. She said, you're not going to prison. I'm going to ensure that you're not going to go to prison. And I looked at her and I said, you can't, you can't, you can't. How can you tell me that I'm not going to prison? My barrister came out when, when that day when we was in court, my barrister come up to me and said, Hezron, you can, you're looking up to 10 years for this, you know? He was like, you can be getting up to 10 years. Not that I was going to get 10 years, but he was like, you can be looking up to 10 years for this. You get me? So anywhere in between that, you know what I mean? So I was like, okay, cool. So I looked at the woman and I said, how can you tell me that I'm not going to prison? My barrister is saying that I'm looking at 10 years. And she was like, listen, leave it with me. She said, I'm just going to write a bad boy report for you. Leave it with me. And I was like, okay, cool. Again, I don't know about none of this stuff. I've never been caught up in the system like that hard. So I leave. About the day, I remember the day before my sentencing, I was, if I ever told you my mindset. And I went to my yard. I bought myself a McDonald's, Burger King and a KFC. Literally went to Burger King, KFC and McDonald's. Bought myself burger meal, chicken, coleslaw, beans. I had free drinks. I'm thinking in my head, I'm not seeing this. I'm not having this again. I'm going to prison for 10 years. I'm, got, I'm crying in my yard. I'll tell you straight, I was barn in my yard. I'm barn in my yard. I'm thinking, I'm going to prison. I'm going to prison. I'm eating the meal. I'm, I'm munching it down. I'm stuffing my face. I'm savouring, you know. Sa <laughs> <laughs> I'm yamming on the chicken. I'm savouring it. You get me? I'm thinking, I'm not eating this again. And then... I go for my sentencing. Still remember what I was wearing. I was wearing my white shirt, my grey trousers. And I was sat in the dark. I was sat behind her like a, like a, it was like a plastic screen. You get me? Like an unbreakable screen. Had the prison guard standing over me and that. I'm thinking, yeah, my man's just going to chaperone me down to the van. Because you got to pass the van as well into the Crown Court. So you can see the van that you're going to be getting taken away in. You get me? So I'm thinking, I'm going, going to prison. I'm in the dark. Oh, it's pounding, bro. I'm sitting there calm, cool, collected. I'm just sitting there waiting for the judge to come in. But my heart's beating, beating, beating. The judge comes in, Mr. Brown, stand up, stand up. And she looks at me and she goes, I was gonna sentence you to prison today. Obviously through the, from the court case, she was like, my sole objective has been to sentence you to prison for what you did. But she went, I don't know who you spoke to though but your pre-sentencing report is glowing. And when I sat there, all I could think about was the woman from probation. When she was saying, don't worry, leave it with me. And I was just like, okay. Obviously she had said that, but she never said the rest. So she then turned around and she said, um, off the back of that report, I'm gonna, make a, I'm gonna make a suggestion that instead of sending you to prison, I'm gonna give you a second chance. But this second chance, is only a one-time thing that's gonna happen. She said, I'm gonna give you a two-year suspended sentence. And she was like, let's see what happens with this two-year suspended sentence because I believe you'll be back here. That's what she said. And I'm just standing there thinking, I don't even know what a two-year suspended sentence is. I'm still thinking I'm going to prison. So she said, I'm gonna give you a two-year suspended sentence, 400 and, no, sorry, that's a lie, um, 260 hours of community service. And then she gave me a hefty fine. And then the, 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 the barrister turned around and went, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> looking at him like, like, well, go on, you get me? And he was like, you can, like, you can go with that? So obviously I'm like, go, like, what, go on. So I walked out, I'm gassed, I'm thinking, raw, like man's beat the case kind of thing. 
And um, I remember, man, I stepped outside and I, when the fresh air licked my face, bro, I ain't gonna lie to you, I was, I was a different guy, blood. It was like, I was fresh out. It's like I, ju- it's like I had just come out of prison. After 10 and I, years. Like, after 10 years and I was just feeling that fresh air. It felt, I can't even tell you how crisp the air felt on my skin. It felt, never felt nothing like it, man. And from there, I was like, nah. And then I was sat in my house with a friend of mine. He was in the same gang as me at the time. Like a couple of days later. And um, I looked at him and I said, bro, why are we doing this? And he said, what do you mean? I said, why are we doing this fam? Like, why are we, why are we repping? Like, why are we doing the things that we do, bro? You get me? Like, I've had man try and stab, as you, obviously you sat across from me, you can see I got scars all over my face. I got scars there, scars across my lip, I got scars all over my hands, my knuckles gone. My knuckles gone, that knuckles gone. You get me? Stab myself there in my hand there. What was you that all me? worth? Oh, this was just during the time, but I was in the game. Just gang. fighting. Just fighting, and that was that was that was a big fight down in town, in um outside the, um, the McDonald's in town. I had a big fight. I ended up stabbing myself in my hand. It was a girl that passed me the knife. I stabbed myself <laughs> in my hand, and then um cut my. That's a man's teeth there. Mm-hmm. That's a man's tooth there. That's a man's tooth there. Cracked my knuckle all the way down the middle, down the side. Were you then pulling some of these teeth out, or did you punch them? Nah, I just punched them in the face. But then their tooth got stuck in my hand. Mm-hmm. Man's looking at oh, you're gonna have to go to hospital for that, bro. Like, yo, that's gonna like it's gonna get infected. That man's teeth stuck in my hand. But there I had a piece of glass, that big stuck in my head. All the skin on my forehead there had rolled over. You could li- literally, it was just white. And it was a piece of glass like that sticking out my forehead. Man smashed the mirror off my face. That scar there that runs on my lip there. Um, I was outside the custard factory in Birmingham, and a guy came with a metal bat and hit me in my mouth. My teeth went through my lips. That's why that's what that, that's what that scarf is there. Mm-hmm. You know that night when that happened, do you know where I went? Yeah. My mum's house. I ran to my I ran to my mum's house. I was on my mum's front door crying, and my mum came out and there was literally blood just pouring out my mouth. My lip was still in my teeth. My teeth were still protruding from my lips. And my mum dragged me into the house. I'm on the floor. My mum dragged me into the house. She had to take my lips out of my teeth. And she was like, Hezron, what are, what are you doing? And I'm crying, I'm like, mom, I'm getting involved in all some madness. And she was just like, what are you doing out there on the roads? Like, what are you doing? It must have broke her heart to see as well. I, I don't know. I mean, what my mom always says is, ah, oh, the reason why you're alive is because I've been praying for you this whole time. Possibly. And I'm like... She must have burnt a lot of fucking yeah, candles, yeah. man. Yeah, she, she must have been praying a lot because I ain't going to lie, God has brought me to where I am now. And don't ever think for a second that I don't believe that. God has brought me to where I am now. He, he made me go through all of that to become the person that I am now, to help others. That's how I see it. Because if I never had that experience and that lifestyle, I would have been sitting here with you now. Yeah, see, I think that as well, that some people need to go to dark places to shed the light to you then to, guide others out of darkness. Like, you have to. Life's a roller coaster. It's, it's full of misery. It's full of pain. But it's also a beautiful thing as well when you can actually... Show appreciation and gratitude, which is difficult, but there's people been through some nasty shit in this world that are standing stronger than anyone else on this planet. You don't wake up and think like life is great and it's amazing. Like it's a constant battle to try and improve it. And you're living proof that people can change all the, the war wounds and the the volatile relationship between you and your mum. It shows you that not only you can change, but your mum can change and she oh, can also yeah. see the world differently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? My mum is a completely different person to how even she was when I was younger. Like, it's that deep that when I was younger, my mum never even allowed people to come into our house. That was never a thing. You speak to anyone that lives in my area and say to, and, and say to them, yo, would you go and knock on Hezron's door? They'll tell you straight, nah, I don't want to see his mum. <laughs> Whereas now my mum's invite people into the house like, mm. no, you can come in, now you can. And I'm looking at my mum like, you never used to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And again, it's just because over time, what she said to us is that the reason why she was like that is because she was very overprotective of us. So she always wanted to make sure that she had that kind of hold on us. You know what I mean? But again, essentially, it made us stray away from the path even more. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back... To that, your friend's house? Yeah, I was, I was, I was in my house and then um, I said, you know, why are we doing this? And he said, we're repping the ends, Hez. Repping the ends, bro. Repping the postcode, fam. We have to, bro. We have to. You get me? And I looked at him and I said, you're telling me we do, we've done all of this over a postcode, blood? Even though I knew it was over a postcode anyway. But 
I said to him, and it just hit me, and I was like, man have died over this, bruv. Like, man have lost man's life for a letter and a few numbers, fam. And we both looked at each other, and he looked at me, and he said, Rahez, I've never really thought about it like that, you know. And I said, fam, man are losing man's life over a letter and a few numbers, blood. I said, you want to know what's even more deep? My mum don't even own a house in the ends, fam. So technically, I'm fighting for the council. <laughs> because... <gasps> well, I ain't got no mortgage, bro. So, so what go on there? You get me? Like, so I'm fighting for the council, didn't it? I ain't fighting for the ends, bro. Mum don't own no house there. And he looked at me, we both started laughing. And I looked at him and I said, you know what, fam? This is dead. And I just looked at him and I said, you know what? I'm going to change, man. I'm going to change. And he looked at me and he started laughing. And he was like, you ain't going to change. You ain't going to change, Hez. I said, I ain't going to change. He said, no way, man. You're not going to change, bro. You're hectic B. That's what he used to call him. Hectic B. You're hectic B, bro. You ain't going to change. I said, yeah. I said, see? I said, okay, cool. At that time, I used to wear all black. Literally, black everything, yeah? Black everything. Gloves and that. Banaclava. My shades and that. Hood up and that. And um, I went to H&M. The next day I went to H&M and I bought myself a white top and blue jeans. And I came out wearing the white top and blue jeans. I put my black clothes in the H&M bag. And when I walked outside, I put the H&M bag in the bin with all my clothes in it. Just put it in the bin, my gloves in it, everything, put it in the bin. And I went to the bus stop, waiting to, get, to catch the bus back home. And this um, old white lady came walking up to the bus stop. So I'm standing there. And she comes and she stands right next to me. And I'm thinking, that's, that's weird. Because as you can imagine, that never happened to me. People were, people were clutching their bags, walking past me. They weren't standing next to me. And um, she started talking to me. Just random, started talking to me. So I looked at her and I said, are you, are you talking to me? She said, yeah, I'm talking to you. I said, oh, uh, yeah, you all right? She was like, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Are you? I said, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. We had a conversation. And then I stopped her and I looked at her and I said, if you would have met me 20 minutes ago, you would have clutched your bag and walked off. And she looked at me and she went, why? You seem like a decent young man. And if I ever told you, it was like, bang. Like, instantly I realized I'm not a bad guy. I've never been a bad guy. And it's crazy because even when man was doing all that stuff, people would say to me like, Hezron, your personality doesn't match the way you look. Because I was bubbly, like how I am now. Bubbly, like, yo, yo, I go on, I go on. But I looked like a thug, like I looked yeah. aggressive. Yeah, but, a mask. Yeah, it was like a mask. But if you spoke to me, I was the coolest. I was cool, man. I was cool, active, yo, come roll. Like, yeah, I was chill. And I realised, and that woman seen past, obviously I wasn't wearing those clothes, but it showed me there on the spot that your appearance actually... Um, it gives off a certain energy and just for the fact that I was wearing a white top and blue jeans this that woman felt that she could come and stand next to me and have a conversation with me yeah. whereas if I was wearing all black she would have clutched her bag and probably stood there next to some other people that she probably would have felt comfortable with and we had a whole conversation she sat next to me on the bus I caught the bus home now where I lived it took about 40 minutes on the bus she sat with me. She was actually getting off at the same stop that I was, funnily enough. And she got off the bus and she looked at me and she said, look after yourself, young man. And I hugged her and I said, thank you. And she said, no worries. And I said, have a good day. And she walked off. And I went back to my flat and my friend came about 20 minutes later. And he came upstairs, he came into my yard and he went, raw. You raw went and did it, Hez. I said, yeah, fam. I went and did it. I told you I was going to do it. And he went, yeah, but I didn't believe he was going to do it, though. And I said, nah, bro, I told you I was going to do it, bro. I said, it's a, new, it's a new me, fam. It's a new change. And then from there, I thought, how do I actually do this? How can I, how can I do this? How can I prolong this? I don't just want to change my clothes and that's it. I want to do more than that. And I realised at the time I never had an education. So um, I went and redid my education, redid my English and maths. I've done a whole range of different courses. And then I got involved with the uh, Prince's Trust, and then I get started with theatre program. How did it? How long did it take to work on yourself? Because oh. it's still a steady process. We're working on ourselves 100%. until the day we die. But how mm. hard was it to come away from your friends who'd been there, who you had accepted as a family, who were showing you love, fake love, but 
It's um, how did you manage to come away with that? So where I lived, I lived away from all of that. Yeah. So the area that I moved to had no form of affiliation to anything. So it was a, it felt like it was a fresh start for me, really. Yeah. It was a fresh start for me. You know what? I just stopped doing. I just stopped going to town because town is where the main link up spot was. So town was the place where I would go and then link up with all the rest of the man them. So I just stopped going to town and then I changed my number. So now man ain't got my phone number no more. So now I've stopped going to town where the main link up spot is. I've stopped going to the parties and all them kind of things. And I've changed my number. All of a sudden, I don't hear nothing. Because now I'm not seeing them guys anymore. Out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind. And I realised, well, they couldn't tell me anyway because I changed my number, but I realised how, how, like, they didn't actually care about me. Them same brothers, yeah, that I thought were brothers, weren't actually brothers. They were just trying to attach themselves in it. Because again, as I said to you, we was all in the same boat. We was all in that same position, broken homes and bad relationships. So... Really, we was all just trying to attach ourselves. We weren't, we, we weren't brothers. We weren't, it was nothing of the sort. Just all using each it other. Was just, we, was, we was all just using each other until we found our place. But now I found my place, so... And you want to know when it actually struck me? Uh, about two years later, I went to town and I saw the exact same group of men I used to hang around with. But bearing in mind, I'm not dressing the same like I was back then. I'm walking and I walk through them. There's about 20 men standing there, you know. I walk through them. Not one man said anything to me until I got out of it and I turned around and I saw one of my bridges and I said, yo fam. And he looked at me all weird. He went, who are you, blood? I said, it's me fam, hectic. He went, <laughs> yo, <laughs> mad. Yo, bro, you look different, fam. Like, yo, what, go on? And I looked at him and I said, you know what, fam? Hold it. Safe. And I walked off. I didn't even hold a conversation. And it showed me that, again, I can walk through them, man, them, and they even recognise me. So that shows me already, me and you ain't bridges, bro. If you're my bridge and I can recognise you, I don't care. It doesn't matter if you've changed the way you dress. I know you. I could walk through them, man. How many of those kids you grew up with? you were involved when back in the day are still alive or how many are dead in prison? That question I couldn't tell you because I haven't kept up to date with it. When I, when I left that, I completely separated myself from that life. Don't get me wrong, I used to get like updates. Like man would say, because uh, my bridging, who um, saw me that day when I changed my clothes, I was still seeing him like all the time because he lived around the corner from my house. Um, he was never trying to force me to go back into the gang. He was very acceptive of me, obviously, leaving and whatever. And I even tried to make him do it, but he was like, nah, Hezron, man, you know, my family's too entrenched, man. You get me? Like, his dad's part of the gang. Like, you get me? Or was part of the gang. You know what I mean? Like, his brothers are part of the gang. Like, so he was like, Hezron, I can't even get out of it like that. You get me? It's like an entrenchment thing for me. Like, my, it's a family thing. So I said, all right, cool. Well, obviously, do you support the journey? He was like, yeah, of course, bro. Obviously, you, like, you know, you do your thing. But he always, obviously, was still rolling with them, man. So he then would give me updates with what's going on. He would be like, yo, did you hear about this? Or did you hear about that? But again, a lot of the time, I didn't even take it on because to me, that was negative energy. That was negative conversation. When I changed, the only thing I wanted to hear was positive affirmation. It was all about positive aff affirmation. Man turned into a Buddhist. It was just positive vibes, positive vibes, positive vibes. And that's always what I wanted to hear. So all the time when he used to be like, yo, Hezron, this man got locked up or, yo, did you know my man died? Or did you know this happened? I always used to say to him, fam, don't want to hear it, blood. Don't want to hear it. Leave it outside. Don't bring it into my yard. I don't want to hear it, bro. I don't want to know about it. Because as I said, I just wanted to separate myself. I wasn't that person anymore. So why am I trying to put myself back into that life and hear about all them things and try and get involved in them things? Why? Don't get me wrong, I still had, I still had um, man saying to me, like, Yo, 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 come on, let's like, let's, let's go lick a yard, man. Like, let's go lick a yard and, yo, here's one, I got a bit of something if you want to slang it. And, uh, I'm looking at that man like, nah, pff, like that. <laughs> nah, that's dead. 
How hard was it that for you to stay in the path at such a young age to come to the realisation that fuck that life? I mean, at that time, when all this had happened, when I had done that change, I was like 22. So still very young. Yeah, I was like 21, 22, but I had matured. I matured from being a 16, 17 year old now, you know what I mean? And I won't lie to you, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, the court thing scared me, bro. The court thing scared me. And, you know, like, no man wants to go to prison. You get me? Like, no man wants to go to prison. I had that two year suspended sentence on me, innit? So, what that meant is, let's say me and you are chilling and you end up starting to do something and police get called and I'm there. Association. I automatically get arrested. Doesn't matter what's going on, I automatically get arrested and go straight to prison. And then my actual sentence gets activated. Yeah? Plus the two years on top, the two years spending sentence gets activated with it as well. So I was like, yo, I'm not going to prison for no man. So I made sure that I just, as I said, separated myself from everything. Valued your value your freedom. That I valued it differently, trust mm-hmm. me. Because as I said, I was like, I'm not willing to go to prison for these man yeah. when I'm trying to change. So why am I going to go for to prison for my man? Because what's going to happen? I'm going to go to prison for my man, but my man's still going to be out here living his life. But then I'm going to be in prison for him. Nah. Yeah, fuck that, man. Nah. Ain't no way when my man's out here popping out babies mm. and all sorts of living his best <laughs> life and that. Man's yeah. up in Dubai and that, chilling. Yeah. Talking about gang gang and free, free my brothers and that. What are you talking about, fam? Mm. No, I'm chilling at <laughs> my yard, man. I'm yeah. chilling in my yard. I ain't got time for none of that. You get me? So, as I said, I just distanced myself and I just changed my whole mentality because I knew that that's, that is what it needed. It wasn't just... When I'm telling you I had a big, big conversation with myself, not anybody else, I'm talking, I'm sat in my yard on my one, just me and my own head, and I was literally just talking to myself, like, here's one, you got to change. Yeah, I know, I know. Full of having a full conversation. I know, I got to change, I know. Nah, man, you have to change. Yeah, I know, I know, I'm going to change. Like, I had to tell myself, again, it was that affirmation to myself that, actually, you need to start doing positive. Yeah. And I knew I could do positive. See the woman who took you in for the two years? Was mm-hmm. she a positive woman? 100%. How did you understand that positivity for such a young age? There was something ingrained in you to, to waken your soul up, to understand that something ain't fucking right. Up oh, Again, it, 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 it comes back to what I was saying with, I was never a bad guy. So when I had done this change... I had brought out that side of me that I never showed people. That funny, jokey, loud, like bubbly side. Whereas I tried to mask that when I was in the gang. You get me? Because again, how can you be like that but be a gang member and you're all hyper and bubbly and all nicey, nicey? You can't do that, innit? So I, I, I masked it. But when I changed, I brought that personality out. And when I brought that pest personality out, I realized that again, I was a friend, I was a friendly, I'm a friendly guy, I'm a friendly person. Like you can come and have a full on conversation with me. I'll sit there and have a full on conversation with you for hours and I don't have to know you. And I just try to instill that into my day to day. Do you want to know what, what actually um, set it in stone for me? Yeah. So when I was doing um, the Get Started in Theatre program, it was at the Birmingham Rep Theatre in Birmingham Town Centre. And I said to myself, when I started this program, three, I set myself three basic, three, three basic rules, and now they're very stupid, yeah. But at the time, they meant a lot to me. And it was things that I wanted to do to try and um, instill that kind of side of me, yeah. So the first one was, I was the first one to arrive. That was my first rule. I'm gonna be the first person to get there in the morning for this course. Yeah, have to be the first person. The second one was, I'm going to be the last person to leave. Do you know what I actually used to do? Or what I actually did? We would all be in this room. I would actually wait for you all to leave the room. Then I would pick my bag up and walk out the room. And I had to be the last man out of the room. And the third one was, I was going to say hello to every single person that I walked past. Mm, no, I did 
How was that? Very stupid. Yeah. Like I looked like an actual madman. Like, like I actually <laughs> looked say that like one, an one, actual. One. I looked <laughs> like an actual <laughs> madman. Yeah. Imagine because people are fucking weird. Man, be, yeah. man are weird yeah. as well. Obviously, as well, I'm black. So <laughs> imagine these men are looking at me like, is he alright? <laughs> Has he got mental health problems or something? No word of a lie. God is my witness. From the moment I stepped into the rep theatre, morning, morning, hello, hi, yeah, uh, hello. Hey, hi, morning, morning. Everywhere I went, I'm walking around. To the point where I never even knew who I was saying hello to. That caught the attention of somebody who was quite high up. The last day of the um, program, so I'd done this for a whole week, you know. Whole week I was doing this. First one there, last one to leave, saying hello to everyone. Everybody knew me when I was going in there. The last day we had to do a play outside um, the rep theatre. And there was two guys standing there. So at the end of this play, everyone's receiving their awards for completing the program. And one of the guys steps forward. Uh, Here's John Brown, where are you? Because I'm the last person to receive my award now. I'm thinking, what's going on? I step forward. He goes, um, my name's so-and-so. I'm a scout for the West End. So everyone's like, <gasps> like shocked, you get me? And then he goes, I want to offer you an acting position in a musical play on the West End in London. So I'm like, me and he was like yeah when I tell people yeah what you wanted me to play <laughs> <laughs> he wanted me to play um, Donkey and Shrek in musical <laughs> <laughs> you can see it now innit you can see it now innit you can see it now innit <laughs> I'm on the road again <laughs> come on Shrek come on Shrek Shrek <laughs> so um, he was like I think you're perfect for Donkey in, in Shrek the musical. Like, you'll be great for that. And I looked at him and I said, but I got no acting experience. Like, I don't know, I don't know what to do. And he went, yeah, I know, that's why um, that guy's standing there. So we pointed at the other guy that he was standing next to. So then that guy stepped forward and he introduced himself and he said, um, do you actually know who I am? Do you recognize me? And I said, nah. And he said, do you know that you've said hello to me every morning since you started? I said, nah. Because again, I was just saying hello to everyone. And he said, I'm actually the directing manager of the Birmingham Rep Theatre. And everyone was like, what? Like, what? Like, and he was like, I want to, um, he said, come to my office next week. I want to offer you an opportunity. So the next week I went to his office. We sat down and um, top floor in the Birmingham Rep Theatre. And I'm in his office and he looked at me and he said, right, Hezron. I'm going to send you off to acting school down in London. I'm going to, we're going to pay for it. We're going to put you through acting school. You're going to get your degree. You're going to come out and you're going to be an actor and do all this stuff. So I was like, I'm, I'm about to tear up. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, thank you. And he looks at me and he goes, nah, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I was like, why are you going to say something like that to me? You get me and build up my, build up my, build, build me up like that. You get me? And he looked at me and he went, because I got one better instead. I said, what do you mean? He said, instead, I'm just going to make you a paid registered actor here at the Birmingham Rep Theatre. And like that. Stroke of a pen. Made me a paid actor at the Birmingham Rep Theatre. Just by saying hello every just day. Just by saying hello every day to random people. But mm. again, not realising who those random people were. Yeah. Them random. This is why I say to young people now, be careful with who you're speaking to, man. Because you don't know who you're speaking to. That person could change your life today. You might just say, turn around and say, oh, good morning to that person. And that person might turn around and say, actually, you know what? I've got a job for you. Come, come work for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, you, and, and even that's something that I, I, I always continue to do now. I always continue to say hello to people and be nice to people because you never know who might save your life one day. Yeah. You never know who might implement your life one day and come in and change everything. So that's something that I'm always cautious of now, but that was the experience that made me think that just from saying hello every morning to random people ended up getting me a paid, or making me a paid registered actor. 
That's amazing, man. That, you know I mean, I, I always try and pay forward as well. Try to do good deeds. I believe the, the better you become, the better you attract. I believe everything's 100%. frequencies, everything's energies, and 100%. if everybody says hello and smiled, if everybody just smiled and says good morning instead of looking at phones, like I was in London and I'm the same. I always try and hello, mm. how are you? Thank you. Open doors. Yep. But people look as if you, when you say hello to somebody in London, it's yeah, like they just put a shit in their yeah. fucking kettle. It's, um, <laughs> you're just thinking you're fucking nuts. But <laughs> I think people are scared to interact now. I think oh, yeah. people are scared to do that. So when you've done that then, did you did you play the part as a donkey? Is that because you were no, so actually, happy? No, um, I actually didn't end up doing it because what happened is when I started doing the acting, I'd done like one or two um, acting roles. And then I realised actually that wasn't really something that I wanted to do. Acting is a, acting's a hard game, yeah, man. Tough. Like, especially as a as a black man as well. There's not a lot of um, castings. There's not a lot of positions that have black cast members. So when I was going for like auditions, the man's name is like Simon. Simon, <laughs> or you know what I mean, or like some proper old school country name. And it's like the the, the script is written for a white man. It wasn't for a black man. And when I actually sat down with um, the guy who got me into that position, he told me straight, he said, Hezron, acting is still a white man's game. That's what he said to me straight up to my face. He said, white, he said acting is, is still a white man's game. Unfortunately, there is not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of cast or scripts that are written for black characters. And even when they are, it's all like gang member stuff or like you're like, you know, it's all, it's all to do with like, you're in a gang or you're this very violent person. It's nothing like positive, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after that conversation, I had a conversation with um, the Prince's Trust and I ended up becoming an ambassador for them. And that saw me going around and I was speaking to, I was going to like corporate events. I was going to gala dinners. Um, and that really changed my perspective because now I've gone from think, knowing the road life to now chilling with like rich people but like legit rich people, not people that have brought it out of drugs and have like diamond chains and cars. People that was wearing sandals and shorts, but they're billionaires and I'm chilling <laughs> with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I started to see a different kind of perspective. I'm starting to speak to business minded people and I started to realize like, raw, this, you man out here doing it legit in your, in your sandals, bro. <laughs> like you man out in your sandals and shorts and you're running the show like that. And man are like, yeah, man. And I was like, Rah. And it changed that perspective for me. You get me? So then from there, I thought to myself, because that ambassador role was only for one year. And after that one year, I stopped having communication with the Prince's Trust. And then I thought to myself, why am I actually out here talking to corporate bosses and celebrities? I thought the real people that I need to speak to are yes. young people in it. They're the man that can relate to me. They're the people that can relate to me. So I ended up going to a school just this random school, I had a relationship with the teacher there. And I said, um, do you mind me coming into the school and doing one of my talks? Telling my life story. And she was like, yeah, here's like, come in one day. I just did it for free, because I've never done it before. I didn't know what the kind of reaction was gonna be. And I went in, I gave the talk. And when I'm saying that, the end of the talk, the whole year group stood up and came to the front. And all the teachers were like, like, didn't know what to do because they literally all just came to the front. And I was like, yo, 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 everyone calm down. I had to make them queue up, make a, make a line. And they all come up to me like, yo, sir, that was mad, you know? Like, yo, sir, I'm going for the exact same thing. And I've got a bad relationship with my mom and I'm, I've got this anger problem I don't know how to control. And I'm in, a, I'm in an emergency accommodation now. And I'm like, I started to see that a lot of the young people had similar attributes to me had, when we're going through similar things. And I thought to myself, yeah, I can help them. I thought I can actually help them. So I ended up setting up my own company, More Talk, More Action. And then for about, I would say for five years, I was going across the country for free, for free. Just going into schools, doing my talk, speaking to people, building up my, just trying to build up my name. Actually, to be fair, that's a lot. I weren't even trying to build up my name at that point. I was just trying to, I was trying to share my story. You're still being fairy before yourself. Yeah. Building, up, building just, your confidence. That's all that it was. Building my confidence, building me up as a person again, getting some of that trauma off my chest, being able to, to, to talk about it with people. But in the same process, try and help the young people as well. And then um, I got a phone call from the Prince's Trust. And because they had heard about what I was doing and all the work that I, that I had done. And they asked me to go to Scotland 
And I was like, what do you want me to go to Scotland for? And they were like, oh, we just want to do a, um, a story on you and the work that you've done. So I said, all right, cool. And they were like, you know, we want to bring it out of that urban looking um, place and we want to kind of bring it into a more like, you know, countryside setting, a more professional setting, because that's kind of how you are now as a person. You're not that urban person anymore. You're more of a professional. So I said, yeah, that's fine. And then when I was up in Scotland, there was a film crew and all that. I'm thinking, who are these man? These man, are, how come there's so much film crew here? You get me? So we're walking around, we're taking pictures, doing this little mini film. And then uh, they said to me that I had to do a, a, a talk with a, a, a journalist. That was like the end of the day. So I'm like, all right, yeah, cool. So I go and sit in this room and this room was mad posh, some big mad chairs. And I'm just like, yo, this is mad posh for like a journalist still. And I looked at the guy and I said, like, who's this person that's coming in? Cause this is posh. And the guy was like, oh, it's, they're quite a famous journalist. So obviously that's why we, ha we had to put it in this space. I said, okay, cool, cool. I'm sitting down. And then the guy looks at me and he goes, I think you should stand up, you know? I said, why? He went, mm, just stand up, trust me. So I said, okay. And then when I stood up, Prince Charles walked through the door and he walked in and I was like, I was like, huh? Like kind of just like set back kind of thinking, like what? Like you get me like, what's going on? And um, he comes up to me and he says, uh, do you know why you're here? I said, that? Nah. He said, you're here because you've won the Pride of Britain award. And I just broke down, man. I was just crying, crying. Even now I was talking about it, welling up like, I was just crying, man. I was bawling. My man was rubbing my back, you know, bro. Prince Charles rubbing my back, fam. <laughs> man was rubbing my back, blood. I'm not lying to you. I had Prince Charles rubbing my back, fam. Man was, man was like, it's all right. It's all right. I'm there like. <laughs> man was there. He looked at the camera, man. He went, turn off the camera. And the cameraman turned off the camera. Again, you don't see all this on the video because obviously they edited it up and whatever. So I'm crying, hunched over. And he says, oh, stand up, man. Stand up straight. And I stood up. And I'm crying. I'm like... <laughs> and he looked at me and he put his hand on me and he said, I just want to say I'm proud of you. From the man that you was to the man that you are now. He said, I'm proud of you. Bro... Different kind of thing, fam. <sighs> Different. I can't even. I can't even talk about it, blood. It just wows me up, blood. Yeah. Different kind of thing. You get me? Cause to have that kind of uh, acknowledgement, you know what I mean? Like a man look at you and say, "I'm proud of what you've achieved." Bro, I sat in that chair, bawling my eyes out, man. Bawling. My eyes were red. I was bawling, bawling. And I just had to look at him and I, and I thanked him for creating the Prince's Trust and obviously what they do for young people or whatever. And initially putting me on that platform with the Rep Theatre, because essentially that's what got me in with the ambassador work. And then that's what made me realise that I wanted to do more. And I just thanked him for starting that journey for me, even though he never did it, but I just thanked him for creating the Prince's Trust. And then I ended up going to the, uh, I, remember I, I remember I came out I was phoning everybody, bearing in mind, they're telling me, I can't tell no one that I've won the Pride of Britain award. I'm phoning everybody, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Yo, blood, I won the Pride of Britain, you know, fam. I won the Pride of Britain. Only told a select, a select people, people that were actually there on my side. And um, I went to the Pride of Britain awards. Mad, mad, mad night. And I ended up winning the trophy there. Phenomenal, brother, from exactly. being... A kid who was homeless, a lot mm. of anger issues, possibly could have done life in prison, possibly could have could been have dead, things. to then pushing the boundaries to try to be happier and forcing yourself to say hello and being happier and changing the neural mm. pathways in your brain, to never quitting, to never giving up. First mm. of all, I'm fucking proud of you. <laughs> I've just <laughs> met you, you today, mate. I'm proud of you because <laughs> it goes to show that people can change and that's oh, the beautiful 100%. thing about life. No matter what age you are, no matter if you're 18 or 88, People yeah. can make changes, no matter how 100%. fucked up you think your life is. You can always better your life, and you're living proof of that. People will watch this and take inspiration. Mm. I know your brothers are here as well. We'll take inspiration. It's phenomenal, mm. brother. And uh, say, this is what it's all about. Yeah, why yeah, I keep these podcasts and that for this stuff, this moment to show people that mm. fuck me, man. The man's just one pride of Britain. <laughs> that, do you know what I mean? Standing on stage, and, <laughs> and uh, yeah. your mum must be proud. Because nah. there must have been a realization. She must have thought at some points that she would she had lost you. Yeah, hundred percent. The darkness had took you and just hundred percent to then fight through that and come out the other end with rainbows and fucking butterflies. And it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be. Do you know what I mean? No, but no, no. When you won that, when you were on the stage and 
what was going through your mind then? Were you thinking, fuck me, is this real? Oh, 100%. Like, I was standing there thinking, how does a man like me be in a place like this? How? Like, how? You know what I mean? And don't be wrong, there'll be a lot of people that will turn around and be like, oh, he should be in prison or, oh, he deserved to go to prison. He shouldn't be there. He shouldn't have that award. He shouldn't be doing that. But they don't see the, gra- the background work that I do. They just see the, the face of it. So they mm. probably see the pictures and whatever and they think, how oh, come he's got to live that life? But they don't see the hard work that I had to put in to get something like that. Yeah. You know, there was real, I'm talking, I'm waking up four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm waking up. I remember I went two o'clock in the morning. I had to wake up because I was going down to Wales. I had to catch train and all sorts. And I'm trekking down there for free out of my own money to, to, to go and speak in a school to talk to young people because I was that passionate about speaking to the young people. Like th- this whole journey, I won't lie, from, even from the Pride of Britain Award, this whole journey for me has just been, it's been mind blowing. Because again, as I said to you, how does a man like me, a man that, went through the things that I went through. But there's a lot of men that have been through half of the things that I've been through and that in mental institutes, literally banging their heads off walls. You know what I mean? But one thing I've always just tried to do, and one thing I always say to the young people, just keep swimming, man. It's from, from that finding, whenever I went, that first time I watched Finding Nemo, I'll never forget the first time I watched Finding Nemo, and Dory was turning around saying, just keep swimming. And it stuck in my head and I was like, you know what? That's all that man have to do. You just have to keep swimming because life will always hit you with hurdles. It will hit you with, with tragedy. It will hit you with cruelty. But it's how you adapt yourself. It's how you move forward with that. Innit? Because how you move forward with that determines what kind of person you are. Mm-hmm. You have to get right in your own mind. You have to sit down with yourself and be like, actually, you know what? I need to make a change. I need to make a difference. I need to be strong. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's, not, it's not always easy. Even people now, people think, people think, oh, my man's so strong. He's so strong-headed. There's been times I've broken down. There's been times I've been curled up in a ball on the floor, crying my, crying my eyes out. You question it. And I've questioned everything. I've questioned my being. I, was, I tried to kill myself when I was younger. Literally tried to kill myself when I was younger. And even that, I say to young people, I say, imagine if I actually succeeded and I actually killed myself I wouldn't be here now the person that I am yeah how much has this changed your life winning this award I'm sitting here with you ain't I yeah that's true man. <laughs> I'm burning the pride of Britain I'm not you sake. know like that I should start handing out trophies mate bro I'm sitting here with you bro <laughs> like, since, since winning the award you know what's been the maddest thing talking to people that would never have spoken to me before yeah on a, on a legit one, let's be real. Mm-hmm. Let's be real. I've spoken to people that would have never even looked at my message, never mind responded to my message. You know what I mean? But I know that a lot of it comes through the Pride of Britain. Yeah, definitely. But listen, I'm cool with that because at the end of the day, if that is giving me a platform to share my story even more, then I'll use that. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, that's my only mission. My only mission is to share my story as much as possible. As you said, to show people that, you know what? You don't have to quit. You don't have to give up. Keep swimming. Keep swimming, persevering, and you will come out the other side. You will come out the other side better, stronger. Mm. And what I always say to people is that, you know, you go through that the one time, you know how to deal with it the second time, don't you? Because the first time you went through it, it was a struggle, it was hard, you had to learn how to adapt and how to, and how to um, take it on board and deal with it. The second time it happens to you, ah, I know what to do. Yeah. But it won't doors, do. man. It's just about riding a wave and taking it it's as far as you come. It's about riding a wave, man. Going forward for the future, brother, what's your plans? The plans is to grow the company as much as possible. Um, we want to be extending even more um, out into the country. So working with more schools, more young people, um, getting more contracts and, you know, just trying to build the name of More Talk, More Action. Because at the end of the day, as I said, that's what it's about, man. Let's try and, we, I'm trying to impact these young people's lives. And however we can do that, whether that's mentoring, whether that's lived experience talks, whether that's skill sessions, whatever it is that we can provide, 
I want to make sure that we've got that implemented in, in, in the schools, colleges, universities. Because one thing I've always said is everybody needs a mentor. Everyone needs a mentor, man. Everyone needs someone to talk to. You might sit there and think, oh, no, I don't need no one to talk to. But you'll find that the moment you start talking to someone and you feel comfortable talking to them, you'll, you'll get all that stuff that's on your mind off your mind. All those things that's on your chest, off your chest. Instead of the suppressing it. Exactly. And a lot of these young people, especially in these times, they've got a lot of pressures, man. They've got a lot of um, pressures from a lot of different things, you know what I mean? Like, these young people are watching music videos, they're seeing other friends doing well. Um, we live in a generation where everything's done online. I'm seeing, like, little 12, 13-year-olds with, like, 100,000 followers, and I'm like, how have you, you like 12, bro? You like 12, you know what I mean? But they're famous. And I'm like, and the young people see that and they're like, I need to, I need to be that famous. If they can do it and they're 12, I'm, I can do it. And they think to themselves that they have to be this certain way instead of just growing up normally and growing up in a, in a, in a, in a way that they can learn for themselves what kind of person they are. And that's the reason why we do a lot of the mentoring in the schools because we want them to, sh we want to bring out who they are Mm -hmm. as a person a and who they side. want that creative side but also who they want to be mm -hmm. a lot of these young people don't know who they want to be what they want to become and we try and help them know what they want to be and know how they want to be and know what they want to become yeah. everybody's got a gift man and everybody's got a gift it's man. Scaling, i believe needs to change in my opinion there's a few things that need to be put in place for kids to understand life money manage management love even death man we don't we talk about death we don't can't handle it well and yeah. we just end up fucking spiraling but for anybody watching brother it's going through a struggle it's maybe in gang life or maybe suicidal full of anger what advice would you give for them just keep swimming yeah don't quit just yeah. keep swimming don't quit mm -hmm. Young people that are involved in that gang life and, and things like that, if you can get out of it, then get out of it. If, you, if you're struggling and you can't, try and seek help. Try and find a service, something in your local area, someone that you can trust, that you can speak to, and, and try and remove yourself from that situation. It's quite hard because I've spoken to young people that have turned around to me and, and said, like, I want to get out of the gang, but I can't because my family's doing it. My mum's doing it. My dad's doing it. My cousins are doing it. What do you say to a young person in that situation? Yeah, it's difficult. Huh? It's difficult. You can sit here all day and say, seek the help, man. Seek the help. Go and find someone you can talk to. But ultimately, that's where they live. That's their support. That's their, that's their network. So whenever they go back to that, that's always what they're going to see. They're always going to see the gang. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to a young person like that? I think the only thing you can do is work with that young person and make that young person believe that they can be more than that. That's what's important, isn't it? Definitely. Making them believe that they don't have to fit that stereotype or they don't have to fit in with the rest of the family. They can be bigger than that. They can be more than that. Show them that you can be different. Why don't you be the example? Why don't you lead the herd? Don't be the sheep, be the shepherd. Yeah? yeah, show them that actually, look, we can do great, we can do greatness. I always say to people, you can do greatness. Everyone's got greatness within them. Everyone can do greatness in this world, but you just have to do it. But people don't do it. They just keep it inside and they're like, no, no, I'll do it tomorrow. Or I'll do it next year or I'll do it whenever I can. Listen, you do it, when, you do it now. And the same with these young people, do it now, you know. So it's... <laughs> What I would just say to these young people is, as I said, keep swimming and try and try and be who you want to be. Like, don't don't fit in with the stereotype. Yeah. Just be who you want to be. Be you. Be you. Yeah. And and yeah, as I said, just don't just don't fit into the stereotype. Don't yeah. fit into the stereotype. It's, again, it's, it's just like don't try and live up to society. Don't try and live up to society. Just be you and be yourself. Brother, for coming on today and telling your story, you're a Thank true you so inspiration much. for what you're doing. A lot of people Appreciate get it. inspiration from your story now and it shows that people can Hopefully. make changes. Can't Hopefully. wait to see what the rest you do for the future. Yeah, man. But for coming on today, brother, and telling your story, it's been amazing. Right, thank God you for having me. You. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.